um, you've got to remember that I'm on my own. And when you're on your own filming the car, it's a bit difficult when you've got lots of traffic. You can't stop the car, set up a camera, point the camera at the car and drive the car by. It's even difficult to use a drone in these situations. So um, most of what you're going to see now is, uh, is me in the car. If I had somebody with me, things would be different. Like now, last bit to go into the car. What began as a quest to find and purchase, no matter its state, my Range Rover that I sold 30 years ago has led me to this. Sleeping the night, curled on the back seat, to be woken by the Australian bush calls and being reacquainted with the familiar smell of gear oil. This series of videos is that story. I'm Andrew St. Pierre White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and traveling to the remotest parts of the world. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe and remember to hit that notifications bell to make sure you catch our weekly videos. It's been nine weeks since I purchased the Range Rover, blind, from the other side of Australia. Now in Melbourne, I collected it, drove it a bit, spent the last five days working on it, and five days worrying about the journey I'm about to undertake. 3,500 kilometres to my home in Western Australia. Yes, I'm driving it home. Here we go. And you find me now dreading really? the Melbourne morning mayhem as I look forward to that all elusive open road. Uh, it's a short run this morning, uh, about only about 350 kilometers. I wanted to do a short run and so I have good time to check the car. I will know what my fuel consumption is, etc. etc. And it will take me a good hour though to get out of the Melbourne suburban metropolitan area it's very big I have Apple Maps running on the phone I have a maps running on the Garmin and they are telling me to go in two completely separate directions and on uh, Google Maps last night my destination was indicated at 447 kilometers both of these have given me uh, about 350 kilometers, which is a little less than I would have liked for the day. But a big discrepancy, and yet again proof I'm not using paper maps. In 800 meters, take the exit on the left to M3 toward Dandenong. Only using digital maps, and I have three digital maps that I'm using, and one of them is vastly different from the others. Paper maps are better, but I don't have paper maps. Turn right onto Heatherdale Road. So, phone is saying turn right. That's saying turn left. This is a major highway. Which one is it? Take the exit on the left to M3 toward Dandenong. I'm going to go with Garmin. Right, so it's an hour and a half since I left, and I'm still in the thick of Melbourne traffic. Um, and we're about to go into a tunnel. <coughs> Goes underneath the city. Car behaving well. Clutch is very heavy. So my foot is getting sore. Really looking forward to getting onto the open road. So I consider this as part three. Part one. 
first, getting the car, seeing it for the first time, and getting it to the workshop. Part two was working on it and pre preparing the car and preparing myself and packing equipment for the trip. And this is part three, the final part is driving it across Australia. So we are on the first part of the last part. I don't know if you can see the city of Melbourne behind me there. That's it. I'm going over the uh, big bridge, as they're called the West West something bridge. Amazing bridge, really, really big bridge. But anyway, you can get a, a glimpse behind me of the city of Melbourne. And from here, I'm kind of actually I've still got a lot of suburbia to go, but uh, I'm, I've got the worst of the traffic behind me, I believe, because I'm now getting out of the city. Time to settle back and listen to some music. Turn around the rain again The bells began to chime Time, she says There's no turning back Keep your eyes on the tracks Somewhere there's blue No time will tell She'll see us through There are few things that I prefer in life than being on the open road. But this is special. It's been such a long time since I've been on the open road, particularly on my own, and in a vehicle that is conjuring up such wonderful memories for me. Howling out the windy hills And all the time we took You should know just how it steals Keep your hand on the wheel and through it all somewhere we know where time will tell she'll see us through and all fire and flames took all we trust we're kicking up dust like they do Oh, time will tell we always knew Very well, and I want to thank 
Stuart and Peter. Thank you guys. I'm Ranger Heaven. You did a great job. You gave me good advice. And you, yeah, thank you. From the bottom of my heart. And I hope to thank you again when I arrive at my destination. After all, you did say... <laughs> if he breaks down across the Nullarbor due to cooler system failure, I will come and help old Mike for it. <laughs> well, I've still got another five days of this to go. So, it's early days. But I must say, I am enjoying this. I really am enjoying this. And I'm doing 93 kilometers an hour. <clears throat> she seems comfortable. The exhaust is very loud. And uh, while I did that change to it, that didn't make much of a difference. The drumming from the engine has been eliminated from what I did under the bonnet. Uh, the gearbox noise has been virtually eliminated because of what I did there. But the exhaust pipe, what I did to try and suppress the exhaust noise, <coughs> didn't help much a bit. It's loud in here. And I think that's what's keeping my speed down more than anything else. Um, I reckon my average is, is going to be somewhere between 90 and 100. That's fine. That's fine. I'm in no rush. Time to tell a story. And to do this, I've taken a narrow track off the main road for some peace and quiet. Up this little track. Why Range Rover? I, I was born in England. When I was six years old, we moved as a family to uh, the then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe and South Africa. And we stayed there for five years. And in uh, 72, we returned to England and didn't like it much and wanted to return to Africa. But before we went back to England. My father, who was very adventurous uh, when it came, came to his travel destinations, took the family to the Okavango. The Okavango is a, an area that I have come to adore. I've been there many times since. And during that time, um, he filmed the adventure on a Super 8 camera and I recorded sound on a little tape recorder. It's approximately 10 o'clock and I can see uh, many palm trees and we are traveling in a narrow stream it was the it was it opened my eyes and it opened my, my my mind to the fascination of bush travel wilderness travel and wildlife and it was the trigger but we took we drove in a triumph 2000 and we amazingly we we traveled along these, these gravel roads through the middle of nowhere and the car stayed in one piece. Shows you how well they were made. And I remember actually driving along, feeling rocks hitting the underside of the car. And having my, when we began the journey, my knees were here. And when we ended the journey, my knees were up here because of enormous dents in the floor pan caused by rocks and things. And we had an incredible, incredible time. So much so that when we returned to England, it was almost like the single most powerful catalyst to, to get us to back to Africa. It was this, it was this um, like, a, like a drug, just this experience in wild Africa, truly wild Africa. It was an extraordinary experience. And I, I recorded on a, on a tape recorder um, a baby crocodile that the guard, a guy by the name of uh, Lloyd Wilnot, became almost famous in the area for his exploits. And um, he was our guide and he, and he caught these baby crocodiles and we held these crocodiles in our hands and they made this crazy sound. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> 
and you can hear my voice in this um, that's uh, I'm 12 and I'm I'm starting my life of, 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 of reportage on film and audio the sky is really dark and bright skies um, so bright stars appear and the horizon is much lighter helping to cement this love of travel and four-wheel drive was when we were we were taken deep into the Okavango to an unmade camp well actually they were building the camp and they were bu busy building the runway and Martin and I Martin my brother we were sitting next to each other in a Land Rover open uh, series 2 and we were being taken uh, driven across by Lloyd across the runway this newly made runway very very rough and he suddenly saw a hyena and he decided to chase it in the Land Rover and I was sitting in the middle and we hit a bump and I came out was airborne for a moment the Land Rover continued without me and then I landed in the back on top of the spare wheel and I was hooked. <laughs> that experience meant that when we had, we were back in England, not particularly enjoying it, yearning for Africa, my father bought a Range Rover. He bought uh, it in 1974. And at the time, you know, my, my little street in our little English village, a Range Rover was a big deal. It cost him 2,480 pounds at the time. And uh, we drove it around in the UK for six months, but to avoid paying UK road tax, we then parked it at uh, Southampton or Portsmouth, I can't remember where it was, I assume it was Southampton, docks, and then didn't, didn't drive it. And then a month or so later, we as a family caught a mail ship and the Range Rover was on board that same mail ship. So then when we arrived in Cape Town, I remember so clearly uh, early, early in the morning and uh, the sun was breaking over the city of Cape Town and you could hear the steam engines. About half past six in the morning and in Cape Town, the ship is moving very, very slowly. On the starboard side of the ship, Table Mountain, a massive slab of beautiful rock, flat on the top, with many lights surrounding it. And now about half an hour later, we're right in, and we're very near the docks at the moment. There's a tug. The tug is pushing us into position now. We're very slowly sliding into position into the Union Castle Line docks. This is probably the biggest, biggest passenger liner that ever comes into this port. And again, I gave my little reportage uh, on my tape recorder. And of course, this is film from my father's yeah, Super 8 camera. Yeah. It's a magnificent morning. The sun is shining across the water and on the table, uh, table mountain itself. Um, Craig, the ship is just being nudged towards the... We then drove it around the bottom of South Africa, uh, camping along the way and fishing and it was, it was fantastic. And we, we, we now are back in Africa and we had ourselves our Range Rover. And we found out later that it was the 11th Range Rover to, to come to South African shores. They weren't made there at the time. They only were, they were first assembled in South Africa in 1979. And I remember we, we were staying temporarily at a, at a friend's place. And uh, I remember my brother and I were, I think we might have been swimming. We were certainly in the garden. And this man walked down and said, what's my car doing in your driveway? And he was quite aggressive and angry. What's my car doing in your driveway? What's going on? What's going on? And I, 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 I remember saying to him, it's my dad's Range Rover. And he froze. And then he walked a little bit closer and then he walked back and he kind of walked in the property around the pool away a bit and looked over the fence and we went with him and in his garage was a Sahara Dust Range Rover parked in his garage. Of the 11 Range Rovers in all of Southern Africa, two of them were next door neighbours. How was that for a coincidence?
And he told me about all these wonderful exploits and he's driven through the Kalahari and his Range Rover and he had done all of these things and he was using it properly and he was telling me stories and of course I lapped it up like milk. Our first expedition in our Range Rover was to the Chobe National Park, which is right up in northern Botswana. I have been there several times since, but the first visit was absolutely magic. And the, the wonderful thing about some of the Botswana parks is you are actually allowed to get out of your vehicle. You're camping in the middle of the game reserve with no fences around you. None at all. There is no protection against the wild animals. And as a result, camping in an area like that is it's it's unsterilized by tourism you, you are desi there are designated campsites where you're supposed to camp but that's it that's it so you, you are exposed to the wild animals of Africa and you, you get to smell them. You get to walk on the same ground as animals. We had elephants walking into our campsite. We had lions around the camp at night. We had hyenas calling. We had baboons barking. I remember lying in my tent recording the baboons barking. And at, we didn't know what they were at first. And I recorded it on my tape recorder. And I guess we guessed that they were baboon. But it was so, it was such an ama amazing experience to actually be camping with the animals. Where else in Africa can you do that? That, that was it. That was, I, was, I was completely hooked. And of course, when I got my first car, it wasn't a Range Rover, I couldn't possibly afford one. Um, I bought a Ford Escort RS, uh, it was like a rally, rally car, um, r ridiculous as a first car. I learned how to drive very, very quickly because I spun it, the first day I had it, I spun it twice. And the third time I spun it, I actually hit another car. Uh, I won't go into that, but it was, a, it was a terrible car to learn how to drive with, I guess. Maybe it was a good car to learn how to drive with, I don't know. Anyway, so uh, that was in 1978 and in 19. 82 I bought myself my own Range Rover it was a natural childish thing to want what my dad had but now let's think about it what else what other four-wheel drives could I have bought in 1982 that would have done the job that I wanted um, Land Cruisers very expensive uh, Jeeps uh, not particularly reliable, um, didn't really want a Jeep. There were some Jeeps that, that would have done the job, but I didn't, you know, I wanted a Land Rover and uh, being so much more comfortable than a series Land Rover. The Range Rover is a far better vehicle than a series Land Rover. And I know some of you will argue with me on that, but the fact is that here we have a modern vehicle. This is a vehicle of the modern age. And that is proof, full-time four-wheel drive, disc brakes, coil springs. That indicates it is a vehicle of the modern age. Whereas Land Rover series, cart springs, uh, drum brakes, and part-time four-wheel drive. Those are more old-fashioned things, particularly the drum brakes. Terrible brakes. Appallingly bad brakes. This has got very good brakes. So it was a modern car. But I wanted to live the dream. The dream were, had the, seed of the, the seeds of the dream were my dad's Range Rover. So that is why I, I first went with Range Rover. The best car I could have probably bought at the time, which would have done the job very, very well, is a Toyota Hilux. I uh, can't remember the model designation, but the one with the solid axles. Um, it, not a modern vehicle by any stretch of the imagination, but very, very reliable, extremely reliable, and actually more practical than this, given what I did with it. But I didn't want a Toyota. Toyota there was no appeal to me at all. And I was, at the time, unashamedly uh, a Land Rover fanboy. Everything Land Rover was absolutely wonderful, no matter what. They could have dished up anything and it would have been wonderful. But, at the time, they were dishing up some pretty great vehicles. 
of all of the vehicles at the time that I could have bought and think now that would have done me well, only the Hilux actually has a place where I, I, you know, that would have been good. But I tell you this, if I had bought a Toyota Hilux, I probably wouldn't be doing this, what I'm doing now. And I say that because these things take a lot of TLC to keep running. I, I rebuilt the engine. I, re, I, built, I basically rebuilt the entire car. With the exception of the front and rear axles, I rebuilt it. So I probably wouldn't have had to do that with a Toyota. And so I wouldn't have learned. That is why I love them. All right. Doing well today. Back on the road. A little issue with the ventilation. If I close everything here, I'm fine. I'm not getting a lot of air. I'm getting some air through the, uh, the ram vent. Um, but it's not strong and the fan is broken. If I open my window like this, or open the quarter vent, I can actually feel it's actually sucking air out of the cab, which is creating a negative pressure inside. And because the rear tailgate seal is in bad, fairly bad shape, it's sucking in exhaust fumes because I've got a negative pressure area behind the vehicle. So exhaust fumes are actually being sucked into the vehicle because this is creating a low pressure area in here. And I can smell very unpleasant exhaust fumes. I have to keep it closed. I have, I have no choice. I either uh, suffocate, they're gone, the fumes are gone. So I can't actually drive with the window open. I have to drive the window closed. A bit of a frustration actually, because it's not hot now, it's warm. I'm gonna take off my jersey, but it's, a, it's gonna have to be something I'm gonna have to live with. If it gets really warm, I'm just gonna have to deal with it. Okay, we have done exactly 370 kilometers and we have uh, used uh, 50 of 3.5 liters of fuel. Uh, topping it up was a little bit difficult. I think that we're a little fuller than we were before. I don't want to brim it because I've got the leak, of course. So, but I'm going to now go and find my uh, motel, uh, open the bonnet, look underneath, make sure everything is 100% with the car and work out fuel consumption. A good run today, actually. Uh, car's going beautifully. So I, I can smell gearbox oil, but that's not unusual for a Range Rover. The sulfur smell of gearbox oil is quite strong. And now, since I filled up with petrol, the smell of spilt fuel. Um, a little bit did come out the back, not a lot. It's not dripping now, so. Uh, let me get my stuff into the room and then I'm going to have a good, good look at the car. Tension's good. Yeah. Quite a lot of grease oozing out of the steering box. A little bit concerning. I'm looking for oil leaks, We're looking for any sign that fluids are leaking. Fuel system. No leaking around the filter. All good. Engine. Quite a bit of oil from the rear main oil seal, but it is not splashing, splashing a little bit on the cross member. 
There's a little bit of grease that's come off the uh, propeller shaft and splashed against the chassis member there. That's not a problem. That's uh, no, no oil coming out the diff, nothing coming out the gearbox. Fuel system, good. No leakage. All good. Everything is looking. Gearbox is rear main oil seal. Yeah, uh, there is oil coming out. It's engine oil leaking out of the rear main oil seal. I mine suffered from that from quite a bit. Uh, I will do a quick check of the oil level now. Uh, and there's seepage from the gearbox filler plug. It's just seepage. The way to tell is to if there's oil splatter spatter around the chassis uh, and on the back axle and you know that you're actually losing quite a bit of fluid it's nothing it's dry 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 so far pretty good fuel consumption i'm reckoning 17 between 16 and 17 i don't think it'll be higher than 17. Um, so uh, i did 370 kilometers i used 53.5 liters that is 6.9 kilometers per liter that is wow 14 and a half liters per hundred kilometers wow really that's good isn't it it's very good that means if I've got an 80 litre tank, I uh, multiplied by 6.9, 552 kilometres in a tank. I was working on 450 to a tank. That's really good news really good news thank you for watching if you haven't already subscribe and click the notifications bell so you don't miss our weekly videos